Hello. Um, so everybody has a chapter one. Uh, my chapter one started with the guy that Steve mentioned. This is Tempt. And Tempt in the 80s and 90s was one of the foremost graffiti artists in the West Coast. And he came down with a disease called ALS, made very popular recently by the Ice Bucket Challenge, which is an amazing awareness campaign. And my company, a production company, said, all right, well, this year, instead of giving our clients a silly gift of a fruit basket or a bottle of wine or something that they're going to forget immediately, let's instead make a donation on their behalf. So we went and we set a meeting with his father and brother and we sat across from them and said, hey, we're going to give you this money. What are you going to use the money for? And they said, I just want to be able to talk to my brother again. I just want to be able to communicate with him. And I said, well, wait a second, how, how do you communicate now? And they said, we do it with a device called a piece of paper. And the piece of paper has a letter, all the letters written on it. We can go to the next slide. And on that piece of paper, when he gets to it, when we run our finger along it, he blinks. And we write that letter down. And then we repeat and we repeat and repeat, and letters form words, and that's how we communicate. And I said, that's crazy. Why don't you have, I mean, I've seen Stephen Hawking and Christopher Reeves, and I've seen these inventions that allow pe paralyzed people to talk. How come you don't have them? And he said, we don't have money or insurance. They're too expensive. And so I have a process. And my process is that you commit, and then you figure it out. <laughs> so I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do two things. One, Temp's going to communicate again. We're going to give him a Stephen Hawking machine. Two, we're going to get him a device that allows him to draw. We're going to get him a device that lets him do his art again. And they said, really? You can do that? And I went, yeah, big hugs, yeah, high five. <laughs> and they left, and we high fived, and I went, holy crap, what did I just commit myself to? Because I, I had never put the words ocular recognition technology together in a sentence, and now I was claiming to do that. So part of my process as well is to invite brilliant people into my life. I like to be the guy at the party who's the dumbest guy in the room, because if I'm the dumbest guy in the room, that means that I'm the guy who's learning. So I invite all these brilliant people to my house, and we have a hacker weekend. And we come up with this philosophy of, and this concept, if we could get a web camera mounted in front of someone's eyes and then track with, with, uh, with technology, track the pupil as if that was the, the tip of the pencil, then maybe Temp could draw again. So we went about doing this, and we came up with this device, and the device is called the iWriter, and that's what it is. It's not pretty, but it's a web camera mounted in front of an eye. And we took it to his hospital room and, and, and set up a projector down in the parking lot and set up a wireless signal from his room down to the projector, and he drew again, and we projected it on the side of a building. So he drew again for the first time in seven years. And it was this incredible... Thank you. It was this incredible experience, but that was it. Like, we didn't have, there wasn't a chapter two to this. This wasn't a, there wasn't a, let's, what's next? We did it. And so we went and got some drinks and talked about how awesome it was, and then we went to bed, <laughs> right? That was it. Well, then we woke up, quote, the next day, and it was Time Magazine's Top 50 Inventions of 2010. It was Gizmodo's Eight Incredible Health Inventions That Transform Lives. It's now part of the permanent collection at the MoMA, and so on and so forth, and media, and media, and we're like, what the hell did we do, right? How did we do this? But then Temp sent us an email, and the email was this. That was the first time I'd drawn anything for seven years. I feel like someone, I was underwater, and someone finally reached down and pulled my head up so that I could take a breath. And we got that, and I said, all right, I don't know what we did, but we got to figure out how to do it again. And we got to figure out how to do it for more people. So that was the launch of Non Impossible Labs. And Non Impossible Labs is based on this premise of technology, but it's technology for the sake of humanity. It's how do you hack? How do you modify? How do you take something that serves one purpose and make it apply to something else so it accomplishes a fundamental social need? some communication, mobility, freedom of expression, something like that. And so this kind of set the course of what we were doing with Non-Impossible Labs. 
So that was my chapter one. This is chapter two for me. Chapter two, about July 11th last year, year and a couple months ago, I went out to dinner. Went out to dinner with a friend, and at dinner, he tells me about this Dr. Tom. And Dr. Tom is a doctor in the Nuba Mountains, which is an area between Sudan and South Sudan. And he is the only doctor within a 1,500 mile radius, meaning he does everything from deliver babies to pulling teeth to appendectomies to, that's, he, he's everything, he's it. And we kind of go on throughout the dinner and we're talking about him. And so I did what a curious individual does after he gets home, after having a couple glasses of wine and a nice dinner with a friend. And I went home and flipped open my laptop and opened up an article about him. Not in the Atlantic, it was in time, sorry about that. And I come to learn about his situation, and his situation is that the government of Sudan, led by President Bashir, is running a campaign of terror on the people of the Nuba Mountains. He flies turboprop planes over this region and rolls 55-gallon drums filled with jet fuel and shrapnel out of the back. That's what he does. And he does this as a, as a means, it's a military tactic, because if you drive the people out, when the military comes in, there's nobody to fight. It makes it an easy war to fight. So the people are used to this. And the, the story went on to talk about a young boy named Daniel. And Daniel was out tending his family's goats. He heard the prop plane coming. He went for cover. He wrapped his arms around a tree. And the bomb went off not far from him. And the tree protected his body, but it blew off his arms. And after, I think it was eight hours, he finally got to Dr. Tom, and Dr. Tom stitched him up. And when he woke, he said, if I could die, I would have, because now I'm going to be such a burden to my family. So I'm sitting at my kitchen table, I've got my laptop, my glass of water, I'm getting ready for bed, and I'm looking down the hallway where, where these three knuckleheads sleep. And I couldn't imagine, if you're a parent, can you imagine if your son or daughter woke up and said, I wish I was dead because I'm going to be such a pain in the ass to mom and dad now? So that was the moment for me. That was the, all right, got to do something. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do, but i got to do something. So you commit and then figure it out. Repeat. You're going to see a trend here. I invite a bunch of people to my house who make me feel stupid, brilliant people, physiotherapists, people that work in 3D printing, people that work in manufacturing and fabrication. We try printing with 3D printers, we try balsa wood, we try all types of different things. The weekend itself was a great success if you measure success about everything that fails, because we didn't come up with one thing that worked. The ticket was bought to Sudan. We were going to Sudan, there was no turning back. This guy had successfully built a hand for himself, and he said, mate, I tell you, you can tell you got that glint in your eye, you're not, you're not bailing on this trip, are you? And I said, no. He's like, all right, come out to South Africa on your way to Sudan, route through Johannesburg, and I'll get you sorted. So I flew to Sudan, I flew to his house, slept on his floor, ate his food, and we spent, you know, six straight nights, 24 hours a day, just going, 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 testing hands, testing arms, learning how to work with prosthetics, learning. I'd never successfully 3D printed up until that point. So we basically came to the end, and we had successfully made a prototype, and I bid his family farewell, and I hopped on a plane to, to Juba, and then a prop plane to Yida, Yida refugee camp, and it was there that I met Daniel for the first time. And our plan was to meet Daniel, and I, it was a nervous experience because this whole thing is called Project Daniel, and never talked to the kid. I didn't know what we were going to do. We were dealing with other people, but I wanted to actually look at him in the eyes. And we got there, and our plan was to load up the trucks after meeting him and start our journey. It's about a nine-hour journey from Yida refugee camp Across the border of Sudan, we'd be going under the protection of the rebels, SPLA, and we'd cross under the cover of night to get to Dr. Tom, where we would start our process. There's a rub. The rub is the ceasefire ended while we were in the air from Johannesburg to Sudan. So security came in and said, I'm sorry, you can't go. It's, we're not, we can't guarantee you safe passage, so you're not going. So luckily, an NGO found out about us and said, hey, why don't you come on over? We've got this shed in the back. If you want to set up shop there while we kind of sort you before you go up to Dr. Tom, go for it. So we jumped on it. We went over there, and we just started making. We set up the printers. We cleaned it up. We swept it up. 
and we started making the cast that Daniel would use for his forearm that, to replace where his arm used to be. We played with kind of the ergonomics of the elbow and just started the making. And there's a saying that I learned there called TIA, which is this is Africa, which is the equivalent of Murphy's Law, which I'm, a po I'm an optimist and I kind of discounted and I got my ass handed to me right quick as soon as I got there and experienced this. Because if it could go wrong, it did. The electricity was wrong. We had to rewire electricity. It was so hot during the day that the 3D printing filament that we had was melting to itself before it even got into my printer where it's supposed to melt and then print out something. So it was one thing after another after another, but eventually we got to November 11th, and this is what happened. There's this thing in me that loves to see things that are supposed to not be done, be done. Daniel is just one of 50,000 amputees left in the wake of the bloodiest war Africa has ever known. We flew into an active war zone in Sudan with 3D printers, laptops, spools of plastic, and the goal to build Daniel an arm. You ready? The concept of Project Daniel was hatched on July 11th. And on November 11th, Daniel fed himself for the first time in two years. But it's never about just one person. If we could teach the locals to do it themselves, then Project Daniel could live on long after we left. And it did. Thank you. I've, I've seen that video probably thousands of times, and I still get that grin when he gets up and tries to throw. Um, so what we're doing around Project Daniel, and everything that we're doing around Project Daniel is around this concept of technology for the sake of humanity. And we're creating inventions like the iRider that we was comparably was 15 grand that we made for $100. We're making devices, EEG tracking devices that allow people with trapped in syndromes to be able to communicate using their brain waves and using their eyes to be able to communicate. The arm, the Project Daniel arm we were able to make that was able to do something that, the arms are 15 grand up to 100 grand and we were able to make it for, 100, uh, for uh, $100. So for us, this is this philosophy of making, using technology for the sake of humanity. This is the philosophy of how do you take something and make it so it accomplishes a fundamental social need. So the question that we ask, and we ask everybody here, is let's not try to cure malaria. I mean, let's try for sure, but if I ask you right now in this room, do you guys want to help me cure malaria? You're going to be like, yeah, sure, Mick. But if I say, let's go help Jim, let's go help Jane, let's go help Susie, there's this philosophy of helping one person and then making that available to many people afterwards, making it open source, making it accessible. That's where the power lies. Is, and our, one of our mantras is help one, help many. So the question that I would ask you guys today is, who is your one? Who is your one? And based on what you just saw, who is your Daniel? Thank you, guys.